here. Hi everyone watching us on Periscope, Zoom, and elsewhere. You might be watching us on Ruzan Ali Abadi on With Whole Ren. Uh, let me do some housekeeping items. First of all, this meeting is going to be on the records. Uh, that's a good thing. And also, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask your questions uh, via uh, Zoom or Periscope. Also, for the audience that are here, feel free to ask your questions over here. Uh, and Alexis will be more than happy to ans answer those questions. So let me, let me just briefly say, this is our first Whole Run Talks in 2019, so, and, uh, and we're excited. Hopefully we'll do more talks on interesting topic, uh, 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 topics. Um, when I uh, uh, met with Alexis prior to the uh, 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 New Year, you know, we talked about, why don't you come over here and help us understand a bit more about Venezuela. I've known him for uh, almost a decade, I would I would Yeah, <laughs> so that will tell, tell our age. Oh, here we go, that's my, one of my favorite characters in company. <laughs> so, uh, so we talked about Venezuela, but uh, uh, when we talked about Venezuela, uh, things seem to be relatively okay by Venezuelan standards, but now, Things are much different. So this is, I would argue, one of the most timely, one of the most timely whole rent talks that we have. So without further ado, let me briefly introduce Mr. Losada and uh, we'll jump into the presentation. Mr. Losada works for a software uh, as a software product manager for a multinational software uh, company called SAP, and his current work involves uh, developing digital supply uh, chain solutions for customers around the world. I know for a fact he's tra traveling a lot to Germany. So throughout his career, he has held positions uh, in both Latin America and also in the United States for over two and a half decades uh, of professional experience in the fields of finance, in the fields of supply chain, uh, and also technology as well. He is a graduate of uh, 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 two graduate programs, one in Venezuela's business school and also Carnegie Mellon University. We have Carnegie Mellon uh, alumni here, mm. not from Heinz. Actually, I think we do have from Heinz. Yes. Yeah, Anybody from Heinz? Heinz? Okay. There, there you go. And so, but the topic is going to be why is Venezuela in crisis? Root causes and uh, future scenarios. And so, without further ado, please give a huge, warm, whole grand round of applause to Alexis Losada, who's here to talk about Venezuela. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I do appreciate the, the opportunity to talk about my home country, Venezuela. Um, and I want to start with a little bit of a personal uh, uh, experience that I had uh, in my hometown uh, of San Carlos, where I grew up, went to high school. Um, the only Chinese community in town live in my neighborhood. And, and the, the, the children of those families went to school with my younger siblings. Uh, Sunday dinner, when my mom didn't want to cook, we bought Chinese food. <laughs> and we also celebrated because our, our country's culture is about, we focus a lot on celebration. So we did celebrate Chinese New Year with the family. And so that's the connection that I have with China. Uh, from being a young growing up in Venezuela um, and that's why almost every year not every year I do actually make a point to go celebrate Chinese New Year so which I know is coming so happy New Year to you uh, as well so well, you might yeah <laughs> so why is Venezuela in crisis okay so when I grew up in Venezuela as a little kid my parents will always talk and read the news the Sunday papers and say we are in crisis and, I'm, and, and we're talking the 1980s, right? You probably were not in your parents' plans at that point. But all I know is that I always heard that we were in crisis. But why is it crisis now? And how does it look like? Oh, thank you. Um, in my own professional opinion, so what I want to talk to you today is less about my political perspective, my opinion, and I just want to show you to the large extent po possible, um, some numbers, right? And what I think is how we get out of the crisis, but why are we in crisis? So today it's all about, let's talk about Venezuela today because it's been in the news. It's been in the news almost every day. 
There was a UN Security Council meeting that was called last Saturday. I listened with my son for as long as we could before going to a soccer game. Um, Today, just half hour ago, the Department, the U.S., the United States Department of Treasury issued some more sanctions. This one is actually sanctioning the financial operation of Siggo, which is an affiliated company of the Venezuelan state-owned oil corporation, PDVSA, PDVSA in Spanish. And so there was a lot going on, right? And you heard a lot of the news. A lot of them are not that great, right? Because as a little kid, even though we were in crisis, as a little kid, and we were in crisis, what were the news about Venezuela? Miss Universe. How many times did we win the Miss Universe? Um, oil, lots of oil. And it's a great country to visit. But now the news are different. So I'll talk a little bit about Venezuela today. I think because we're focused on education today, I'll give a very brief history of Venezuela. Um, and then we'll talk more into the details related to this crisis, the evolution of the role of the state, political incentives, policy decisions that led us to the crisis. And then the results that are leading to an everlasting crisis because we have been in crisis. I've been hearing about it. I've been experiencing it since I was a little child. And then at the end of the day, I wanna come out with, at the end, every problem has a solution. And some solutions are more of a long-term solution, which really matters to people's livelihood and people's love for, for their homeland. So how do we overcome that? So at this point, I'll provide some perspective. So what is Venezuela today? What do we hear in the news? Humanitarian crisis. Venezuelans are not eating enough calories for the last two years. The people are fleeing. Close to three million people have left the country, mostly coming to the neighbors, Brazil, uh, Colombia, Ecuador. The, the, a lot of the South American countries have been receiving a lot of Venezuelans, mostly Colombian, which is, I think at this point, is over a million Venezuelans that have fled the country. A lot of them coming to the United States, a lot of them migrating to, to Europe as well. The children of European immigrants are actually returning to their grandparents' and parents' homeland. So it's the largest migration in the Americas, believe it or not. That many people have not migrated out of any country in the Americas. So that's a little bit historical. We're talking about hyperinflation. Hyperinflation, I thought that that was a problem solved a long time ago. No, it exists and it exists in Venezuela. Hyperinflation actually was a, a problem in South American economies in the 70s and 80s. It's no longer a problem. It is a problem in Venezuela. We'll go through that. And then you hear about violations of human rights, political prisoners, and that goes on and on and on. And I'm not gonna get into the details, but there are some serious problems related to violations of human rights, abuse of power. So what are the latest news, Sarah? So here are some dates, right? So May 20, 2018 presidential election. There was a presidential election on that day that was not recognized by the majority of the democratic countries around the world. Most, mostly South America, the United States, Canada, Europe, thought that that was a rigged election. So, but Maduro, Nicolas Maduro, the existing president of Venezuela then, was re-elected. But it was not an internationally recognized election. January 5th, 2019, is the new term for the National Assembly in Venezuela. The National Assembly is the, is the Venezuelan Congress. And the new term is started on that day. January 5th, Juan Guaido gets sworn in as president of that National Assembly in accordance to some of the negotiations with the opposition political parties. It was Juan Guaido's turn to become president of the National Assembly. January 10, is the end of the, is the end of the uh, constitutionally recognized presidency of Nicolás Maduro. So after January 10, Venezuela has no longer a, a recognizable elected president of the country. So according to the Venezuelan constitution, and I'm not a lawyer, but I read the law. <laughs> according to the Venezuelan constitution, in absence of a president, right, that he has now been elected democratically, or it's absent, 
uh, the president of the National Assembly becomes the interim president of Venezuela. And so Juan Guaido doesn't even need to be sworn in officially or formally before Congress. He becomes the interim president. And the law says that in 30 days, there should be elections to elect a new president of Venezuela. January 23rd, 2019, I don't know if you saw the video or not, but I would recommend you to look for it. Juan Guaido before a crowd, people came out in, all over the country, millions gathered across towns and cities in the country. In the city of Caracas, the capital of Venezuela, he goes and says, well, I'm ex assuming the executive power as the interim president of Venezuela, and we're gonna work through a transition and eventually get to elections to resolve our political problem. So that is what's happening in the latest news. So now you, you read some news, news medias, you read that you know, Venezuela has two presidents, there is a coup going on, there's a lot of noise around what's going on in Venezuela. Um, but I just wanted to share with you what the law says according to the Constitution and why Juan Guaido is all over the news who, by the way, is a 35-year-old engineer with a young daughter. Um, and it's, it's an amazing, uh, <laughs> it's an amazing, uh, 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 you know, nobody expected this. That right now, the person who is leading the transitional or some sort of political transition in the country is a 35-year-old engineer, right? Um, but that's, that's the fascinating part of it. Brief history of Venezuela, okay, I'll be as fast as I can. Starts in 1498, when Christopher Columbus' third voyage hits the, the northeastern coast of what Venezuela is right now. And then Alonso, Alonso de Ojeda is the first Spanish conqueror commissioned to explore more in that territory. 1521, this is really where the Spanish, I mean, it took about 22 years for the Spanish to really start colonizing the, the territory. 1700s, Spain combined what is now Venezuela, Ecuador, Colombia, Panama into one vice royalty, the vice royalty of New Granada. Sp the Spanish kingdom at the time, they, they, need, they wanted to organize little pockets of powers in their colonies in the Americas. So we were part of the vice royalty of New Granada. Something really interesting happened in 1810. So Napoleon Bonaparte, right, had become as basically the dictator of France. And he wanted power, like many other Western European countries. He overthrew the king of Spain, right, and put his brother, Joseph Bonaparte, as king of Spain. That revolted the Spanish Americas, the Spanish colonies in, in the Americas, and basically led to the, the independence movement really in the country. Because the, the, the colonials here in the Americas did not recognize Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's brother, as the true king of Spain. So they wanted to rule by themselves here. And so that kicked off a series of things all across the Americas, the, the, the Spanish colonies in the Americas. But in Venezuela, a year after that, forces, both domestic and foreign, led to the Declaration of Independence. A year later, we came and said, all right, you know what? We're gonna be an independent nation, and we declare war. And our declaration of war was very interesting. We said to the Spanish, please leave or die. We didn't even say, let's join, join me. No, no, leave or die. Don't join me, I don't care. So that happened, that enrolled us in basically a war that lasted for over 20 years. Um, you know, the conflict went on, even though technically in 1819, we became the Republic of Gran Colombia, which proclaimed Ecuador, Colombia, and Venezuela as a Gran Colombia, one single country. We were a single country for about 10 years, a single nation, but war continued until really at the end, in the mid 1820s, there was the last battle that happened in Venezuela that basically drove out the last big important Spanish commander out of the territory. A 
1820, 1830, we become, we secede from the Gran Colombia and we become the Republic of Venezuela with the capital in Valencia, eventually to Caracas. But that's our history. So we come out as a very conflict-driven country. And then the rest of our history is about the same. Basically, the rest of the 1800s for us was civil war. Our way of ruling the country was about who was able to gather the most people with guns. That took over the country. And then as that involved, there were some people who really ground power and ruled for a, a little bit of an extent of, of period of time. Antonio Guzman Blanco actually was the son of a guy who ruled Venezuela 20 years before. But what's interesting about him is that he's educated in France. And when he becomes president of Venezuela, he modernizes the country a little bit. He brings French architects, buildings that start popping up in the city of Caracas, the capital. The, the edu public education system is first established in the country. Theaters, monuments. So he really starts bringing more, let's say, civilization to the country. But it is not until the early 1900s when oil is discovered in Venezuela. And we have a military dictator that rules the country for 27 years. So basically that, the only benefit of that was that it eliminated, it, it stopped civil war in the country. And there was one ruler. He passed away. And after he passed away, the military continued to have power in the country, but then there was a moment of transition to democracy, which was they started doing some political reforms, allowing some local municipal elections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But transition to democracy started in the 1930s, all the way until we, on January 23rd, so keep that in mind, 1958, the last military dictator of Venezuela was overthrown. And that started a transition process that, that ended in 1961 with the first democratically elected president of Venezuela. Universal voting, secret voting, um, balance of power, and that's when we started really experiencing modern democracy as we know it. Um, so January 23rd, 1958. Juan Guaidó swears himself as the transitional president of January, January 23rd. So he's been very clever to use all historical symbols in the country to, to maneuver politically. And then we go all the way to 1998. Hugo Chavez, you probably heard of him or not. He tried to do a military coup in the early 90s. He failed, he was pardoned, but he runs for president in 1998 and he wins. I was there. Actually, it was the first time I voted in Venezuela. I was a much younger man. But it was the first time I voted for Venezuela. And at the moment, there was this discontent with the political establishment in Venezuela, with the, 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 the political parties, the old political parties. It's actually not very different from the way it feels these days here in the US, where there is a lot of discontent with both the Republicans and the Democratic Party. Venezuela was about the same. There, there were tiredness with the establishment. So they look for an outsider. Sounds familiar? So it's a similar world that we're living in. There are a lot of countries around the world right now looking for that outsider, right? So Trump could be considered an outsider. The newly elected president of Brazil could be considered an outsider. Uh, Emmanuel Macron was an outsider to the French political establishment. So a lot of that dynamic has been happening across the world. Hugo Chavez really, at the end of the day, it was a, a, a democratically elected president that turned authoritarian. He was only allowed to rule for six years. He ruled until he died. <laughs> so he bent the system and bent it to his favor, for his political favor. And then as, as he was dying of cancer, he comes and says, he picked his winner. And he said, well, Nicolas Maduro is going to be the guy who's going to continue the revolution, his revolution. And so that's why Nicolás Maduro takes over his, as president of the country until now, right? Until he still remains with political power in the country. Brief history, I cover a lot over <laughs> 400 years of history, but this is a little bit of a brief. So let's get into the details of the crisis. 
a little bit of the evolution of the economy. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is about the, the, the I'm going to navigate between the economy and the role of the state. So, and I hope I, I'm as clear and fluid as, I, as I'm planning to, to do so. So the evolution of the Venezuelan economy, it really sets the stage for what has been creating the crisis that we're referring to. Before the 1910, Venezuela was really an agri agriculturally driven economy. Really, at the end of the day, we were great coffee growers, cacao growers, um, and you know, we, chocolate was, comes from the cacao fruit. Um, there's still Swiss chocolate out there that only uses Venezuelan cacao, so I would recommend it, it's very delicious. But before that, it was mainly an agricultural economy that exported coffee and cacao. But then after that, oil was discovered in the country. Right around the time, oil actually was being discovered here in the United States, no far from here. You know that town that is called Oil City, PA? That was one of the first discoveries of oil here in the United States, around the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s. Well, that technology that was being created here the rigs that were used to pump, you know, drill the oil and pump it out. That was actually taken to Venezuela. And, and we were part of that evolution of new technology and the energy. Um, so from 1910 to 1940, um, there was an explosion of the oil economy. And that really changed the game for us. Because the wealth that came from selling, you know, producing oil and selling it to the world, made us the third largest exporter of oil after the United States and the Soviet Union. So I have a picture here from 1960 to 1969. Seven, about 11% of the total crude oil production came from Venezuela. Here in the yellow one is the United States and the blue is Russia. And then we have Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. So what that means is we were really a leading producer and exporter of oil. And that really changed our life. But what happens, 1940s, there was this conversation. Wait, wait a minute, what about our development? It's not just extracting oil and selling it, but what about the people of Venezuela? So the people who were in power started saying, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to enact a law in 1943 that says it was famous because it was the first time somebody in government said, hey, look, oil companies, how about 50-50? <laughs> you keep 50% of the profits, we'll keep the other 50% of the profits. And that kind of set the stage for this movement to say, hey, wait a minute, we need to have control of our resources. We, the people of Venezuela, need to have control of our resources. Well. That led to the 1976, a year after I was born, now you know how old I am, the government nationalized the oil sector. So all the oil corporations that were managing the oil business in Venezuela, they were nationalized. So that was the birth of PDVSA, which is Petróleos de Venezuela, and that set the stage in motion a series of changes for our country. For once, the state of Venezuela became very rich from a treasury perspective. A lot of money was were coming to the national treasury. A lot of money was being used for budgets. Budgets grew, etc. Right? And so there were some reforms from the 1970s. But at the end of the day, um, PDVSA, who was actually ranked in 1992 as one of the best state-owned uh, oil corporations in the world um, to right now is being, their accounts are being frozen, but there's Treasury Department. <laughs> PDVSA hasn't been in the news lately because production has gone down, et cetera, et cetera. But that is what we're gonna, that's the beginning of what I consider is our crisis. So with this very large economic power, the, the state grew unaccountable to the people because they have money that don't depend upon the people's tax taxes. So politicians who managed the state were completely unaccountable. And that tilted the balance of power from the power of the citizen to the power of the politician controlling the oil business. 
And that really put a stress on the democratic process. When you're very rich as a state, really, you don't have a lot of desire to reform. So very much needed democratic reforms and economic policy reforms, they were always postponed because there was always oil coming in. And the price of oil went up and went down, and we went up, party, 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 went down, we borrow, went up, party, 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 and that was kind of the, the attitude. There was not much interest in, in, in reforming. And this is when, in, in the world of political science, they talk about uh, corporatism. Corporatism is when a state is really more interested in, 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 in responding to the interests of the corporations that they control rather than the societal interests, right? So they're very narrow. So this is basically set off bad policies for us. So this, there is a very famous vicious cycle. It's been documented everywhere. People who have studied poverty in Venezuela, study economic, the economy of Venezuela. We always talk about the vicious cycle of devaluation. Since about 90% of the dollars that came into the country were managed by the state, right? I could spend in local currency as much as I could. But when I overspent and I have big budget deficits, all I needed to do was devalue the currency. So I will have more local currency for each dollar that came in. So I will devalue my currency constantly and create, you know, to cover for my bad decisions, my budget deficit that always happen. But also had an impact on inflation. By printing more money locally, you're gonna create, you know, basically uh, uh, a constant inflation in the country that was not necessary. But then there were other really bad policies. We thought, because we were part of OPEC, which is the, the cartel set up uh, by mostly countries in the Middle East, something connection between Iran and Venezuela. Actually, it was the Secretary of Energy and I might be wrong, but I, th I believe it was the Secretary of Energy of Venezuela and the Secretary of Energy in Iran who started the conversations about create, creating OPEC. And the whole idea there was like, well, let me, let me control production so I could keep oil high. That's a really bad policy. Because at the end of the day, the, the price of oil is really a world market. You, you have absolutely very little control of what the dynamics are about supply and demand. But we made the bad policy to, th to say, well, let me, let me not invest as much in production because that, that way I can keep the price of oil high. That was not the case. Then when there were other po policies, price controls, telling people how to price their products. Could you imagine if the United States came to Apple and say, hey, Apple, don't sell the iPhone X. Is that the latest? Oh. iPhone 10? Don't sell it for $800, you sell it for $50, so that people can buy it. That is what price control is all about, right? Price controls are typically an economic policy that is very useful in the very short term. Very short term, and when I say three months. Venezuela has had price controls for over decades. And what that means is there is no incentive to invest, to develop, because how is that going to be profitable for, for anybody who has an, an, an entrepreneurial initiative in the country? With price controls, you basically kill the incentive to do anything, to invest, to make a profit. And then exchange controls. I, have, I'm, I cannot, whatever activity that I do, if I set up a company, say, okay, I, I sell locally, but I also export. My product is really good, right? So can you imagine if the United States government comes again to Apple and says, hey Apple, by the way, you're not free to buy euros, transacting euros, you're not free to, to transact in yens or yuan or any other currency. There's gonna be, I'll give you a quota how much currency you can buy. Once again, bad policy. It kills entrepreneurial spirits, it kills production. And then inflexible labor laws, hard to fire and hire. Um, you know, it, 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 that it actually is something that happens across many economies, that they thought that by, you know, to protect somebody from being hired and fired, even though independent of that per person's performance at work, uh, you can keep employment high. That's, that's terrible. Actually, it's the reverse effect. Um, subsidies and more subsidies. 
because of oil, because a lot of the decisions about the oil business were based more on political rather than, uh, uh, you know, you know, business decisions. We subsidize everything. Do you know that for, this is not now, since I was a kid, a liter of gasoline has been cheaper than a liter of water in Venezuela. Made and sold locally has not made a profit for decades. Can you imagine that? It will go bankrupt, right? But in order to support this, you, that money has to come from somewhere. That money has to come from debt, from devaluation, that's running deficits, right? And so for me, the era of Chavez and Maduro, which, you know, here right now, you will say, you know, some, some, uh, from, from an opposition perspective, you will hear people say, well, you know, all of these problems because of Chavez and Maduro. I actually argue that what they did, it was, he did, they did more of the same. More of the same that other, other governments in the past were doing. Nothing changed, more of the same. The only difference is that then there was a, a significant amount of intervention into the economy during those terms that translated into expropriating property and nationalizing the majority of the economic activity. Could you imagine a world where Target, Giant Eagle, Walmart, pick, pick a grocer. Can you imagine that all of those grocers were run by the state? That's what's happening in Venezuela. Sugar plantations, cooking oil, you name it. It's been either nationalized or expropriated. What's been happening with this is an economy that was self-sufficient, especially with food. We were a country that we produce enough food to feed ourselves. There was a little bit of export, coffee, cacao, sometimes sugar. But a lot of the product, food that we consume was made, was produced, was cropped in the country. Venezuela right now imports about 90% of its food. And that is what's leading to the humanitarian crisis right now. Because that was great when the price of oil, if you remember, was about $100. Not so great when it's about, what, 42, 60? You cannot keep importing enough for, for 30 million people. That's why people are fleeing. So all of this it's, it's are, are, are problems that I consider as structural. And they have been happening since I was born. So again, as the state nationalized the oil and gas industry, and by the way, I'm focusing on the oil and gas industry, but in the 1970s, we nationalized the, the mining industry. We, we made steel, aluminum, uh, gold, among other minerals. Uh, all of that is also nationalized, but a lot of the data that is easy to gather these days is on the oil and gas industry. And it's the biggest one, in, uh, contributor of the economy. But take a look at this. Since the 1960 to 1970, the yellow bar here is the crude oil production, a million barrels per day in Venezuela. You see the trajectory? It was just going up. And the reason why? Because the oil and gas industry was run by businesses who were making business-driven decisions, focused on profitability, efficiency, maximization of my return, of my investments, of the risks that I'm taking, right? But then in the mid 70s, oil was nationalized. So what's the pattern that you see? Going down. I do know for a fact that basically the, as the oil, you know, oil corporations in Venezuela, you know, Royal Dutch Shell, Exxon, Mobile, some of the ones that you know today, Back then, I mean, they started disinvesting in the country when they knew for sure that the government was going to nationalize the industry. So some of the effects that started, we, we started seeing the effects in the economy even before the, the law was enacted. Um, and remember when we were like the third largest producer? Look at our share. Our share was about 11%, remember that? Well, now it's about less than 3.5%. So we're no longer and now, uh, there are other factors that play in a role there, but for sure, the fact that we did not continue this growth trajectory, right, and we decided to decline, that, that's part of the problem. And what are the effects of that? So here's another trend chart, GDP per capita, right? 
from 1968 to 2016. So the yellow line is Venezuela. About $14,000 GDP, $14, GDP per capita. We were about, back in the 60s, we were about a medium income country. And really here, you, you read some of the, if you, if you love history as I do, if you, leave, you read some of the business news or economic books that were written back in the 50s and 60s, we were set out to be the first developed country in South America. That was, that was, we were the star, the shining star in the country. We were not only with a great expectation of economic prosperity, but we were actually the only democrat, democracy in the region, in South America. So the, the expectations were really high. But what happened to us? Okay, so the gray line here is the rest of the Latin America and the Caribbean countries, just to make a comparison. And the orange line here is China. And so what, what's the difference here? We kept growing, but we've been going down, and we've been very erratic with that GDP per capita. Can you imagine if we did what you guys did in China, or what the country China did, which was set the country to a fast growth rate, we would have been pretty much along the lines of the same income as some of the United States, Canada, Europe, right? But that's what these policies, this change, led us to do. We remain with GDP per capita about the same time from 1960s. While other countries, like China, the, the bundle of South American countries, they started going on a growth path as well. These are the roots of, of an structural change that led us to our economic demise. And with economic demise, and this is the important part about the economy, we can talk about all these technical aspects about the economy, but what matters about the economy is about people. Because at the end of the day, it's the livelihood of people. We talk about GDP per capita, and this could be a very cold metric. But at the end of the, end, the, end, at the, end of the day, these changes do affect the way we live, the way we eat, how we study, the quality of education we have, the kind of healthcare we have. Right? Whether I live, I remain in the country that I love, or I look for, for opportunities in other countries because I'm not happy here. That has an impact, and that is significant. This is why this is important. Because at the end of the day, the economy is about the people. It's about whether I have a job, a good education, good health care, I have a future, I can create a family, I can invest, I can create a business, I can buy a house. So, as I mentioned, the incentives change, right? And how did the incentives change? With the state controlling the biggest business in the economy, there was really very little incentive to invest in the country from private enterprises or create private enterprises. So you see the blue bar here is the investments in Venezuela as percentage of GDP from 1961 to the early 2000s, right? We went up a little bit, and it's been an ongoing decline. And we know that if we don't invest, right, in new things or maintaining the existing things, the economy declines, right? And so very, the, the levels of investments into the country have just systematically been going down and also has had an impact on growth. We used to grow at 5.95%. That today is a great growth rate. Right now, 2000s, 0.46%. And I don't have the latest statistics, but Venezuela in the last three years have lost 35% of its GDP. This is why people are fleeing. Again, the tie between the economy and the people. People are fleeing because if, if your economy declines by a third, there are not a lot of jobs or opportunities. You gotta go somewhere else. You gotta eat, as basic as that. But also you see the incentive. As soon as the government started taking over the oil and gas business, what happened to the government consumption as percent of GDP? It, it went up, right? So now you have a government that has a much larger role in the economy, much more dependent. So when I say incentives change, two incentives change, one, 
as a private investor, I'm not going to put my money in Venezuela that much. I'm just probably going to maintain what I have. But I'm not going to invest in nothing new. I'm going to go to other countries, right? Uh, China, Japan, right? Uh, other countries that will create that opportunity for me. So that was one incentive, right? The other incentive was now the oil and gas business was giving the state so much money that now a lot of the, the I could make all kinds of political decisions that could afford the loss of economic activity, the loss of democratic reform, and I'm just going to live off this budget, pay up. And with that, actually, something that I have not addressed is corruption, right? And so, so that, that, is, that is a phenomenon that just kept growing in the country. So by design, the results of all of this, it's an everlasting crisis. So we talk about hyperinflation. This is, this is the annual percentage of average consumer prices year on year changes. So this is kind of the year on year change of prices in Venezuela. Here I'm plotting a trend from 1995 to 2016 and I'm bundling, I'm comparing Venezuela with the largest economy in Latin America. Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, and then this blue line is Venezuela. You see something in common? Right now we're talking about hyperinflation right now, right? Yeah, hyper terrible, terrible. Right now we're talking about 200% inflation a month. Can you imagine that? Prices are changing that fast, right? But that's not new. The, the problem just got worse. Venezuela has had the highest inflation rate compared to the largest economy in Latin America in the last 20, 25, 30 years. So this is a problem that goes back a long time ago. We're just noticing right now, but it's been an ongoing problem that has not been resolved. And this is other indicators. So the orange line that you see here on the left is the percentage of households under poverty in Venezuela. The blue line is the percentage of households under extreme poverty. And it actually took me a long time to put this chart together. I mean, the studies of poverty are very interesting. How you measure poverty, fascinating. I, I need to get paid to, to do that because I would love to study that for more. But at the end of the day, this is, you see, you notice something. So this is from 1975 all the way to 2015, right? As soon as the structure of the economy started changing, poverty went up, right? From 26% in the 1970s, we've been averaging in the, about 50% for 30, 40 years, 40 years. There was a big decline here, and this is in the 2000s, and this is why I brought this chart. Right? So this chart is basically an indicator of the Brent and the WTI, which are two uh, price indicators of the barrel of oil globally. You see this all the time on the global Bloomberg, on the business news, etc. But what I wanted to show you is poverty went down it's because the oil, the price of oil went up extremely, extremely high. Right? Remember those days, a hundred dollar barrel. But then as soon as it started declining. Poverty went up in Venezuela. So what does this say? We depend on the price of a commodity. Our welfare is dependent on the price of a commodity. The welfare of 30 million people are dependent on the price of a commodity and political decisions. No business decisions, no rational economic decisions, but political decisions. So how do we overcome the crisis? And, and I make an emphasis on how do we overcome it structurally and sustainable? Because I'm betting for the sustainability of my country, right? So I look at things from a short term, medium term, and very important part of it. But at the end of the day, the biggest lesson that I want to talk to you today before I get into the details, and I'm going to jump into the conclusion right away, is that in any, any country, independent of government design, economic design, 
if you don't have leadership that believes in in um, a learning society, a society that is capable of learning continuously and, and able to manage change, you're gonna to lead to problems like Venezuela. And what that means is that if you don't reform, change will happen to you. But in this case, change will happen to you in a bad manner. So you need to be proactive and you need to be intelligent, especially in the world that we live today. We know that there are certain things that are, 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 are basic in order for a society to function and create prosperity. So we need to reset the country, establish rule of law and democracy. I love democracy, I grew up in it, I want it back, right? But in the short term, we need to establish this transition government that you're hearing from, secure political power, that is still in question. We need to open for an aid to address the humanitarian crisis. We need to borrow money, unfortunately, to activate the economy. The good news is Venezuela today ha still has 20% of the oil reserves across the globe. You look at that, it's amazing. We still have a lot of oil under the ground. And that gives us the leverage, fortunately, still gives us the leverage to borrow money to activate the economy in the short term. But medium and long-term solutions, for me, you know, politically speaking, I mean, you gotta have transparent and fair elections. Let the people decide. Let them decide their destiny. We need to create balance of power, autonomies, a judicial system, Congress, a presidential system, uh, institutions that are balancing each other. We need to decentralize political power. We need to decentralize power to the regions where people are, you know, are, are, are making decisions locally where it matters to them. We need to introduce legislative reforms, which are obvious along this talk because it's all about economic liberties for prices, currency exchange, and labor. The most painful part because of this political process that we've lived in the last 20 years is there's gotta be justice and there will be no justice, no peace. Societies need, need to have justice, otherwise there will be no peace. But more importantly, we gotta change the model of a state control of the economy. We gotta change the way we've been doing things for the last 40 years. We cannot pretend that we can solve our problems by doing the same of what we've been doing for the last four decades and they have not generated positive results. So we need to change the incentives. We need to focus the state in provisioning public goods and services. Justice, security, foreign policy, fire department, the police. But then we need to privatize a lot, right? related to anything that is related to production of private goods and services. No longer the state should be in the business of mining, oil and gas production, groceries, out of there. And we need to create greater accountability for public officials and politicians. I think the less power they have, economic power they have, the more accountable will be for us. And we need, we need to have a, an autonomy of a central bank in order to really manage the inflation problem that we have. In fact, there are talks about dollarizing the Venezuelan economy and actually converting, eliminating local currency and adopting US dollar as a currency. But these are more technical, you know, I just wanted to share some of more detail uh, of what I believe, how we're gonna overcome the crisis. But my message overall to that is that if we don't structurally change the way we've been doing things in Venezuela, we're never gonna get to where we really want which is a prosperous country, a peaceful country, a democratic uh, country. So I want to end this with this picture um, because I actually was here on this, right here on this bay. Um, this is not far away, uh, far away from where I, 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 was, I, I grew up. It's one of my favorite places on earth. Um, and I would love one day for you to be able to come to and visit because it's a great country. Uh, for those who like seafood, great seafood restaurant right there. <laughs> but thank you so much. So I, I want to be done talking, I think. And then, so if there are questions, uh, I will take them right now. Um, if well, first of all, let, let's give you a round of applause. Thank you so much. This was a well. Thank you for this presentation. If you. Uh, uh, it was relevant, it was effective, it was efficient. How did you go through so much history in five minutes <laughs> in one slide? To me, that was, that was very interesting.
So um, I do. I have some online questions okay. uh, and some student questions. Some of them, my students that have okay. uh, our students have asked these questions. So let me also let me before I ask that I'm gonna go ask you my let me ask you my first question. Um, why should be watching and why should we caring right now immediately about the aftermath of what's happening in Venezuela? Well, I I, I think that. Um, so let's talk about the humanitarian crisis. I mean, you, you cannot run a country where, you know, about 3 million people have left the country. That's about 10% of the population, right? So you gotta put a stop on that because what that means is these are people who are going to other countries, countries that may not have the resources to support, you know, that level of people coming into a country, right? That, that means, you know, you gotta provide shelter, right? To those folks. So that, that's why it's so important, right? Um, I think what's important is the, the economy of Venezuela um, was, is highly connected to many countries because of oil, right? And it is important that uh, we create a stability in the economy as it relates to the, the supply of oil. The trend that we are going is basically if we keep going the way we're doing, we're, we're going to stop producing oil in the country. Nobody's going to provide a dime, invest a dime in Venezuela to produce oil. Right, and so we need to create transparency also in the way the economic activities are done in Venezuela, because it's also posing a, a risk to to the security of the region. And what that means is, if if you cannot formally in the world we live today, if you cannot formally transact legally, that means you're transacting with somebody else whose origins of money are questionable. That, that's why they keep saying, you keep hearing, that Venezuela poses a, a risk to regional security. It's because financial assets are being used uh, inappropriately. Question, it says, uh, I, meant to, um, I meant to ask you what happened in the past months that made the drastic change with all the bad policies that have been around for decades? Well, I, I, to be honest, I, I don't think this was a reaction to, to what I just spoke about, <laughs> what happened in the last 30 days. What happened in the last 30 days is that um, the, the rules of the game, uh, based on the rules of the game, somebody wants to t stay in power forever and illegally, and you know, somebody who was not elected mm. in legal ways. And so, that is what's creating this this current situation happen. I don't think you talk to some. So this is a concern of mine, actually. You talk to some opposition political parties in the country, and you talk to their economic advisors. Some of them don't think. In fact, they would not. They will disagree with what I just talked to you about. They think that they could be better administrators of the oil business, right? <laughs> and so, so our, what I have put forward today is actually very challenging to, to the local thinkers, for some of them, not everybody, but for some of them, this is a big challenge. And part of it is because it touches a lot of interests that are used to this model, mm -hmm. right? That's interesting you say that. So if you're in Venezuela watching and you're somewhere in politics, you should implement some of these things that Alexis <laughs> are talking about. I have five questions here, but let me go around. Is there any questions around the room that people like to ask? Okay, right now there are two presidents in your home country. Okay, before the presentation, I want to ask you which president you want to support. But after the Presentation, I got an answer. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, like, the, the question I really care about is the, the money that is really owing to China. Will the new government repay, I mean, pay back the money? <laughs> I'm going to give a round of applause to this question. <laughs> So I, I, actually, I was really waiting. I thought that was going to be the first question, by the way. <laughs> I, sh I didn't open it up to the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, all right. So let, let let me let me let me tell you. Uh, yes or no, sir? There is no. <laughs> no, no, no. Because I, I, these are problems that are not. I, I don't think a yes or no question yes, will, will will suffice here. So let me talk about a little of what I know about China's involvement in Venezuela, right? So China has been basically investing in telecommunications. So Huawei is being heavily involved in Venezuela. 
China is also being uh, investing in some mining interests as well. But the biggest bill that China put in Venezuela was this Venezuelan Chinese Development Fund. I think it's called that way. It might have a different name. That the Chinese government set up with, when Hugo Chavez was president. I believe it was about $10 billion, right? About half of it was um, dispersed. And all this was supposed to be for development purposes and stuff. Um, that money is nowhere to be found. Okay, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not involved, but that, that based on the news and the reports that I read, that money disappeared. That money went nowhere. And let me put it this way, that money is not producing anything in the country. So it went to some people's pockets, bank accounts, you name it. Okay, the Chinese government knew this. And so basically what they said was, well, I'm not gonna disburse the other five billion. Actually, start paying me this by sending me oil shipments, okay? So there are two things that I know about the oil business that are very interesting. One, any, you know, <laughs> the oil business, you need to refine it and convert it to gasoline and other byproducts, right? But refineries are like cooking pots. They don't take any ingredient, right? So the Chinese refineries in China, they don't, they are not wired to, to use the type of oil produced in Venezuela to refine it. Right? So the Chinese government, as far as I understand, is they don't, and also, we don't typically export oil to China. So it's very costly. It will have to go to the Panama Canal and, and travel across the Pacific, right? Pacific Ocean. What the Chinese are doing is that they're, they're getting those shipments of oil, and at the Panama Canal, they sell it to the secondary market. And that's how Venezuela has been repaying this. How much has Venezuela repaid this to the Chinese? I have no idea because there's no transparency in the transactions of what's going on. What I think, my opinion is, Venezuela, this new transition government, eventually, or soon, is gonna have to create, create some sort of commission that will go through all those contracts with, with a country like China and say, look, we're serious, but let's start with the legality of this financing that happened. Was it constitutionally approved? Was it legal or not? But at the end of the day, you, ha you have to negotiate because China is a business partner in Venezuela and we want to keep it that way. I'm of the mind that if you're a partner, you want to come and invest in my country, well, let's negotiate in a manner that is effective, transparent, it, it creates benefits for both because that's what partnerships are all about. So that needs to be redefined and it has to create transparency and really be geared to where, where, where it's supposed to be, which is create economic activity in the country, not go to somebody's coffer. I know a little bit more details, but let me so take more short questions. So the answer is it's complicated. <laughs> but, um, but, um, so we only have two minutes left. Yeah, so, oh, sorry. And, no, no, no. Well, thank you so much for your time. So I'm gonna, I have five more questions. I'm going to ask them in order, some of them. Just, I'll be short. Sure. Yeah, that would be great. So first, <laughs> first is they ask, have you been to China? No. Okay. Not yet. Okay, that's one. Okay. Not yet. Uh, will China support Venezuela? I think that's an open-ended question, so I, I don't know what that means. But what's the question? Will uh, China support Venezuela? I don't, I think I, that's, that's the question. Well, the, the, know, why, the, why, the why, government why, of China, yeah. government of China uh, uh, is supporting Nicolas Maduro, recognizes Maduro as the president of Venezuela. So. Uh, will young people like to go back? I'm presuming they're talking about young Venezuelans will go back to the country. Yes, especially the ones who left in the last two or three years. They will go back. They will go back. Mm -hmm. um, and two more. Uh, China and Venezuela have the same model. Why didn't it work for your country? <laughs> we did not reform. Okay. All right. You guys did. You introduced reforms. We didn't. And what is the worst thing that can happen to your country now in Europe? I think the worst thing that can happen, it's already happening. Okay, and I want to close this with a very personal experience. About a year ago, I went to Venezuela for my father's uh, surgery. So I had to navigate a healthcare system that is crumbling. Okay, so it's personal. And the wars already happened. I was at a private clinic. My father was about to have surgery. 
the day that he was preparing, they needed blood donors. I was gonna do, I was part of those who were gonna donate blood. The, the blood bank at the clinic said to me, we don't have the reactives to process that blood. So you're gonna have to bring the blood from somewhere else. I had to go to another town for three hours to get blood and bring it back. And I was able to find that blood because my father happens to be a doctor and he had connections. And during that journey, which was six hours long, I was thinking in the back of my head, what if my father was not a doctor? What if he didn't have the connections? I wouldn't have my father. And that's the reality of a lot of Venezuelans today. So the worst is already happening. And the only thing, the only worst that can happen is that this continues. Because at the end of the day, this is turning into the systematic eliminations of Venezuelans. We're leaving or dying. Those are the options right now. And so I don't want to close this with a gloom and doom, but it's serious and it's personal. It's personal. Uh, so I don't mind that. Well, we're all hoping for better days. We've seen you, you write this rise of populism, so many ad hoc politicians, but also so many crises going on around the world. Yep. I don't know if whether we have more crises going on around the world or perhaps we have higher access to information. Is this a new thing or has it always been like this? Not Venezuela, but around the world and we're just noticing it a bit more. But we really hope for better days. But let me go on an optimistic note. As the Chinese are going to celebrate the new year, I hope this new Chinese year brings, a, brings more prosperity stability uh, to Venezuela, to the broader world. And, uh, and I also want to end on this since uh, all of us are extremely foodie. Uh, do we have very good Venezuelan restaurants in Pittsburgh that we should go try? So there is one that I, there are two, but there is one that I like. Uh, it's in the south side on 9th Street on Carson. It's called Cilantro and Ajo. Go there, it's kind of a fast food concept, but you'll get the basic stuff. The chefs are two young couple with two young girls and they cook phenomenally. On Sundays they have specials, soups, I'm a soup lover. And so every Sunday there are soups there that are great. Um, if you're a vegetarian, there are a few vegetarian options, but you're not gonna enjoy the full menu of, because we're a meat and potato type of country. We, we eat a lot of meat. Uh, so, so yeah, I will recommend that. So please do so. It's, it's budget friendly too, because it's kind of a fast food concert. So not sit down a few tables, but go there. Uh, you'll, you'll get, you'll get good, good food. Not only we can go there, then we can say who sent us. We can also talk a bit about Venezuela. And if yeah. conversations get heated, I will give you a copy of the PowerPoint so you can pull out slides and show them what's going on. With that said, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh-huh.